When um, I was invited to present at this conference and, uh, and uh, participate in it, um, it really got me to thinking about co-responsibility. And, um, and I love that quote from Pope Benedict that was, uh, that's on the website and on the registration material. Co-responsibility demands a change in mindset, especially concerning the role of lay people in the church. They should not be regarded as collaborators of the clergy, but rather as people who are really co-responsible for the church's being and acting. Coming from education, we talk a lot about collaboration. And so this idea of co-responsibility was, uh, was really challenging to me and, um, and took a lot of prayer and reflection to, uh, to lead me to, uh, to my thoughts today. And so we start with really this idea of, um, of responsible. What does it mean to be responsible? And, um, and that's where I really started my thought process. And so looking at the, the word responsibility, um, some things jump out at me. We have duty, accountability, liability, right? Uh, these are things that are burdens and, um, and can weigh heavily on us. And so I really began to think, what are the things in my life that I feel responsible for? My children? my job, because I work with, uh, with um, principals. My, my job includes you know, principals, teachers, parents, children. We serve nearly 18,000 children in the Diocese of Orange. And um, I thought about being responsible for my team back at the Department of Catholic Schools, um, my husband, who accompanies me on this journey. And so, Really, when you think about all the things that we are responsible for, um, it can be paralyzing, right, in, in the work that we do and in the being that we are called to be. And so it got me thinking, if, if me, if I feel burdened or paralyzed by these things for which I am responsible, then, um, then certainly other people are feeling this way too. But then, as I reflected on this, I thought, okay, but how then can I reframe this as a woman of faith? What then is Christian responsibility? In 2016, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops published a beautiful document, uh, really in alignment with a lot of what we've heard already today, entitled The Co-Responsibility of the Lay Faithful in the Church and in the World. And in this document, we are reminded, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. We love because he first loved us. The life of Christian responsibility, then, is really to respond to the love of God. And when we hear this word, again, responsibility, instead of thinking of obligations, we're called to reframe that into opportunities as Catholic Christians. And ultimately, we want to respond to that original love of God that was offered to us in the person of Jesus. Christ expresses this love by incorporating us into the body of Christ at our baptism. And therefore, we belong to a community of faith by virtue of our baptism. And it's only with this awareness, then, that we are not alone, that that burden is lifted, and that we are free, then, to be the people that God calls us to be and to respond to his love through our work, through our service, through our being. And so when you can reach that path, we recognize the beauty of this idea of co-responsibility. And so I think that, that our role as church leaders, as diocesan leaders, particularly for me as a leader of a system of schools, is to reframe this idea of co-responsibility as an opportunity rather than a burden. Through baptism, every Christian receives incomparable dignity and a noble mission, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. As St. Paul told the Corinthians, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. This is so, so beautiful. And while it is liberating, it's challenging for us. And that's why we have these conversations and these explorations.
But we keep coming back to that through our baptism, we are part of this body of Christ, this part of this larger church. And so we never respond to God's call in isolation. We never respond alone. Just as we form one body of Christ, so our response to God's call is always lived out in harmony with the other parts of the body of Christ. And so I'd like to share a little bit about my, my personal experience with, um, with the church, my personal journey through Catholic education, and this idea then of mindset. Because as we've heard, this, um, it, if, if we are to embrace our call to co-responsibility, we need to embrace this shift in mindset in order to enable ourselves to, to move along this path. So, uh, so I'm a, I was uh, born and, and uh, baptized as, a, as an infant. Um, I'm one of a fan of uh, seven children. I grew up in Pomona, California. And um, my parents were uh, very uh, faithful uh, Catholics, raised their children Catholics, and all of us to Catholic school. And, um, and really, my formation began at home with my parents. And when I think back to spiritual leaders in my life, I think back to my parents and, and praying with them, uh, praying the rosary in our living room, um, celebrating feasts of the church with our Advent wreath, and, um, and different things that now I see in the realm of education, children are not exposed to. Uh, all of us went to Catholic school and um, when uh, I entered the teaching profession, I actually started teaching at St. Joseph's School in Pomona, which uh, was the school that I had attended. Um, I did not graduate from Notre Dame with a degree in education, as they do not offer a degree in education. Uh, but I had a marketing degree, and I spent five years um, in sales and international marketing. And one day, Sister Carol Marie, who was the principal at St. Joseph's School, tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, Aaron, have you ever thought about teaching? And I said, sister, I'm not a teacher. And she said, Aaron, have you ever thought about teaching? And so we started a conversation. And sister knew me. She knew that I was uh, uh, a good kid from a good family, that I had been well-formed. And um, that started the discernment process for me. And that has been throughout my life that there have been many people who have been instrumental in my faith life and in my uh, personal and spiritual and professional journey that have seen things in me that I didn't always recognize in myself. And they've tapped me on the shoulder. And now I can look back and see that that was the work of the Holy Spirit. When I was 27 years old, I didn't recognize it as such. And so, uh, so I started teaching. And uh, I remember my first day in the classroom, I taught 38 second graders. And um, I didn't have an aid, and I had never had an education class in my life. And I fell in love. And I never looked back. And so throughout my time as a teacher, I went back to school and I got my credential. And then I started a program in a Catholic school administration because I knew that I was being called to administration at some point. And so after eight years in the classroom, I became a principal at St. Luke's School in Temple City, which is in the San Gabriel Valley in California. And, um, and I spent seven years in, uh, in school administration. And um, for our Catholic school principals um, out there, I have so much love and respect for our Catholic school principals. Um, even at the diocesan level, I, I do believe that being a Catholic school principal is one of the hardest jobs in the world. And so I have a lot of love, love, love for my principals, and I tell them that all the time. And so after uh, seven years as a, um, as a principal, you know, I really recognized that um, I, I had changed from being a, viewing our church as very obedient and, and complicit with uh, with the pastor. You know, when I was a teacher, there was a, an opportunity for me to um, prepare liturgy with our children. And I remember, I was a first-year teacher, um, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with our pastor who didn't want our children to proclaim the word of God. And I said, Father, how are they going to learn if we do not teach them, if we don't allow them the experiences? And, um, and I really pushed back, and I felt that it was my responsibility to be the voice for these children in our church. And as a principal, I recognize that when you work um, in the governance model of a parish school, that that collaboration with the pastor is necessary 
for the success of the entire community. And um, there, there were times that there was a struggle, and I, and I had really good pastors who supported Catholic education. Um, I felt that I had the responsibility to ensure the success of the school, but at the end of the day, I was not the, uh, I did not hold all of the authority. And so there were times that I really, really struggled with that idea of authority in the church. When I uh, was called to diocesan work and became an assistant superintendent, uh, I really, really recognized this struggle with authority. I worked with about 30 schools in the uh, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And again, I felt this responsibility resting on my shoulders, but sometimes I felt in competition or at odds with the local pastor. And so this idea of having all of this responsibility for the success of the schools, but none of the authority. And so it was at that time that I really realized that a change in mindset was necessary in order to move this mission of Catholic education forward. And great things can happen when we're allowed to work in collaboration with our pastors. And when we each recognize and accept this idea of co-responsibility for the mission of our church. Let me just share uh, one story with you. Um, one of our, our uh, small schools, really a fledgling school, we were down to uh, about 80 students. Um, and uh, we had a brand new principal in there. And it was really the time that we needed to, to either make a decision to, to close the doors of this school or, um, or really go, go full forward. And so, uh, so we introduced a blending learning program and, um, and worked really hard with, with the principal, but we worked equally hard with the pastor. And the pastor knew that his role was not only to support the principal, but to support the mission of Catholic education within his community. You know, this is a school that had 500 plus kids in the religious education program on Saturday and Sunday. And so his role was to journey with these families, companion them, to bring them into the fold of the school, to work with them on how they could bring their kids into Catholic school. And, um, and that was, was really a turning point for me in this idea of mindset, to recognize the miracles and the beauty that can happen when we work side by side with our pastors in the mission of Catholic education. And so, when uh, I was uh, invited again, tapped on the shoulder to uh, move to the Diocese of Orange to become the superintendent, I remember perfectly the conversation with a friend of mine who, um, who uh, was the, uh, she had been the superintendent at the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and we were having breakfast and she said, you know, Aaron, the Diocese of Orange is gonna be looking for a superintendent. And I said, I do not want to be a superintendent. I was not cut out to be a superintendent. I do not feel called to be a superintendent. And, uh, and we had a conversation. She said, the Diocese of Orange is, uh, is, is different from LA and, um, and uh, it's much smaller. And you know, we, we just, we had a conversation at the end of, of uh, we were eating breakfast. I walked away and I said, you know, I said, you know, I'm gonna pray about it. And she said, I'm gonna pray for you. And that started the discernment process. And again, the Holy Spirit is relentless, and, um, and she kept tapping me on the shoulder. She tap, 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 and coming to me through different people and different experiences. And I will never forget um, when the job was finally posted, um, it was about four pages, single space, like eight point font, and, um, and I had knots in my stomach reading the job description. And yet I knew, I knew this was what God was calling me to do. And, um, and so, as I've come to the diocese, I've been there since July of 2018, serving as the superintendent of schools. Again, this idea of uh, this shift in mindset and this change of heart has come over me. And when, uh, when the, the, the opportunity was first presented to me by this friend, um, I didn't know the bishop. Uh, I didn't know who, who Bishop Kevin Van was, and, but I knew that the superintendent worked for the bishop. And my first question was, who's the bishop and what's his stance on Catholic education? I said, I know who the superintendent works for. Um, bishop Van is a huge advocate for Catholic schools and that's why I knew that I could go forward then on this path to, uh, to partner with him and, um, and our, our auxiliary bishops to further the mission of Catholic schools in our diocese. My bishops, uh, Bishop, not only Bishop uh, Kevin Van, uh, but Bishop Tim Fryer and um, Thomas Tan Nguyen, um, they have really companioned me 
on shifting my mindset. And I found in them willing partners in, in the vineyard and willing partners to help further this mission of Catholic education. And really, they were just looking for a worthy partner. They had already reached that shift in mindset themselves and were waiting for me to come to that point. My recent meeting with uh, uh, Bishop Tan Nguyen, who I directly report to, he, uh, he told me that the qualities that make me a strong leader in our church uh, is my conviction with which I lead. And um, he said, Aaron, you are a person of integrity and deep faith. You lead with love and you are guided by prayer. And that is what makes you a great leader in our church. And so I needed this shift in mindset and in my heart to be open to this idea of co-responsibility and opportunity that God has given me, as always, guided by the Holy Spirit. In um, California, we have a, a very strong um, Catholic uh, conference of bishops, and this document is a very living document within our schools. And this just furthers my mindset that our California bishops um, really, really support the work of Catholic education in our state of California. Now more than ever, we're convinced of the importance of Catholic schools and we are committed to forming new disciples of Christ. Uh, this is an action plan that our superintendents work on every time we meet. We're a, a body of 12, um, no coincidence there, uh, 12 faithful servants, and, um, and we meet three times a year in the state of California, and we have monthly conference calls. We're very much committed as a, as a cohort, if you will, of uh, diocesan educational leaders to further this mission of Catholic education. And, um, and this really is our anchor document as we uh, work through the different uh, opportunities and challenges within our own diocese. And so this uh, personal journey that I've been on really has led me to uh, this realization that we need to focus on shifting our own mindset first before we can even begin exploring this idea of co-responsibility. First, we need to focus on ourselves and look at where our hearts and our minds are in this idea of co-responsibility and work on shifting our own mindset first. In uh, the Diocese of Orange, when I, uh, when I was hired, we had just finished a strategic plan. And so as the superintendent, I was given a binder about four inches thick of this strategic plan and said, here you go. Um, and uh, while that can seem daunting to me um, as a researcher, it was uh, extremely exciting. And, um, and it's given me uh, a roadmap for the work that is ahead. In our strategic plan, we have uh, five different areas, evangelization and faith formation, governance and leadership, clergy formation, stewardship and finance, and Catholic schools. Catholic schools are given um, so much um, uh, reverence, really, and the, the importance of Catholic schools is, uh, is so respected in our diocese that it really is a standalone pillar of this diocesan-wide strategic plan. And so our, uh, our core priorities in Catholic schools are uh, these uh, four areas, Catholic identity and faith formation, uh, governance and leadership, operational vitality, and academic excellence. And I'll, I'll come back to those uh, in, a, in a little bit. But on top of those, uh, our uh, collaboration goals uh, were something that really kind of touched on all four of those areas, but, um, but were something that because of my leadership and my desire to collaborate with, uh, within, the, uh, the, within the focus of Catholic education that I brought forward as well. And so, uh, so our collaboration goals, you can see, develop approaches to strengthen collaboration between our principals and our Department of Catholic Schools. Uh, previously, there had been a breakdown, and our principals felt very alone in their own mission, within their own parishes, within their own work. And so it was really, really important to me to ensure that we were building this collaboration. And I always talk to them, again, being in education, we talk a lot about collaboration. Um, but we are Catholic schools, we are Catholic school educators, and so it's not merely enough to just collaborate. Anybody can collaborate. Our public school counterparts, they collaborate professionally. But we are called not only to collaborate, but then lead that into community, which, because we are the body of Christ, leads to communion. And so we go from collaboration to community to communion. And now, because of our mission, 
that leads to co-responsibility. And those, it's, it's, it's been this, um, we can't jump from nothing to co-responsibility. We've had to build. And it starts with that collaboration and meeting people where they are. And so this has been a, a very big um, driver of mine. And, um, and it all starts with that faith community and prayer. And, and relationships, and, um, and a lot, a lot of time was spent during my first year working, uh, working on this. We also uh, have a collaboration goal of working with our pastoral center staff to develop a description of the role of uh, pastors within parish schools. If we are to work with our pastors, we've got to tell them what we want them to do, what it means to be the pastor of a parish school, how we need to work with, with them, what is the mission, and all of those things. And so, um, so we can't expect things of people if we're not going to, to give them the resources and to have those conversations. And so, uh, so I've been, uh, been working on this with, uh, with different areas of our pastoral staff, with our bishops, and uh, with our pastors, not only on new pastor training, but with the current pastors that we have and what that means to come along on this journey as well. And so our, uh, our mission statement, because everything we do is focused in mission, one of those collaboration goals to get to that uh, co-responsibility, it's all focused on mission. And um, our first year, we spent a lot of time developing a mission statement for our Catholic schools. As a ministry of the Diocese of Orange, in partnership with our parents and our parish families. Our schools are committed to making disciples of Christ through Catholic faith formation, academic excellence, and service to others. Our students transform the world. And we really believe in this, and everything that we do is tied to mission. And when you have that mission statement anchoring everything that you do, then you can start exploring co-responsibility. Um, what has worked well in this, uh, this idea of co-responsibility? We've, uh, we've done some uh, um, work with our Office of Evangelization and Faith Formation. We've really partnered with them uh, in the diocesan offices. Uh, who, you know, those of you who work in diocesan offices, um, we're kind of known to be silos. And part of this work in our strategic plan is to, is to break down those, uh, those barriers and to not only, again, collaborate with one another, but to share that responsibility for our common mission. And um, this past year, we've, we've, uh, we've uh, collaborated, we've uh, shared responsibility um, with the Office of Evangelization and Faith Formation in retreats for our principals. It went really, really well. And we decided to then try to scale this out to our teachers. It didn't go so well for our teachers. Um, I think that there was something that was missing in that, that small um, encounter with one another and with Christ that is present when you're working with a small group of 25 to 30 that is hard to scale out. And um, we found out through this process that sometimes you need to, to bend and tweak in, in ways that uh, maybe you're not used to. Um, we also recognize that as, as school people, and I, and I say that for, for me and my team who have all come up as, as teachers and as principals, um, we think differently than our counterparts in faith formation. And so coming to the table and exploring that and having those conversations is really, really important um, to come to this common understanding of what co-responsibility for the mission means. And, um, and it's not until we can, can be honest with one another and share our strengths, our talents, but also our fears and our worries that, um, that we'll be able to, uh, to execute and move forward in this mission. Um, if we don't do these things and come with a heart that is open and a mind that is open, then we tend to shut down and put the walls back up and just walk away frustrated. And so one of the other things that I have discovered in this shift in mindset is that a shift in mindset is messy. It is messy when you're working through this. And, um, and you need to be patient not only with yourself, but with those who you are working, with whom you are working. And so um, our vision for the future in our schools department, we're in full implementation of this strategic plan. 
and we recognize this call to action and, uh, and the work that we're doing. And I must say that in the Diocese of Orange, and I, I say this uh, 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 privately to people I meet, I say it very publicly, the Holy Spirit is hard at work in the Diocese of Orange. I believe it with all my heart. I believe it with the people that have come to work along with me on my team, with um, the transformation that we're seeing with our principals, with our teachers, and ultimately with our students. And so um, we are a people of hope. We are filled with hope. And sometimes when you get bogged down with the busyness of the work, you forget to dream and you forget to hope and you forget to aspire to be the people that God calls you to be. And so I love this, uh, this quote from Pope, Pope Francis, that hope opens new horizons, making us capable of dreaming what is not even imaginable of dreaming what is not even imaginable. And we have got to be people of hope. Otherwise, what is, what is the point, right? And so I've, uh, I've, I've come to this, uh, this uh, idea of hope in these four areas that we work on. And in leadership and governance, we have hope as helping others promote equity. And um, we do this in a variety of ways. We've um, really focused on our leadership formation for our first year principals um, with a, 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 a focus on prayer and spirituality, building up our principals first as spiritual leaders. You can teach them the nuts and the bolts. They come to us as educational leaders, but it's that idea of spiritual formation that will really, really transform our schools and so to support them on this journey. Um, for our second and third year principals, we've partnered with um, the uh, CSJ Educational Network in, in Orange, the Sisters of St. Joseph, and they've been wonderful partners and, again, co-responsible for this mission that is so vital to, uh, to our our church. And so, um, so, again, talking about leadership and governance, working with our pastors on that collaboration goal, working with other areas in our pastoral center to ensure that pastoral leadership is, uh, understands uh, the, uh, the mission of Catholic education as well. In the area of operational vitality, we hope by helping others plan effectively. And um, one of the things that I think, I don't know if it's unique, but it's a blessing, is our, our close working relationship with our finance department and recognizing that even in finance, everything is tied to mission. And the decisions that we make in budgeting, in hiring, in HR practices are all mission-centered and need to be infused with Catholic identity. Um, we have uh, implemented a shared business model for seven of our schools. That's been very, very successful, and now well, we're hoping to scale that out. And this really helps our underserved schools that maybe can't afford a bookkeeper or an accountant, and we can, we can scale this model out to, uh, to other elementary schools. We also um, have shared employees, even at the pastoral center, uh, within the finance department that um, serve our Catholic schools, report to me, but also report to our CFO. And that connection is so very important for the runnings of a Catholic school. It's re-educating our principals and our business managers on good stewardship that is always mission-focused. And it's responding boldly to our call to missionary discipleship by introducing new models of education to better serve the changing needs of our communities. Uh, we'll be starting our first dual language immersion school next year with a plan to roll out two more schools in the next two years. And, um, and again, really looking at the needs of the community and responding to them in a responsible way. In the area of uh, academic excellence, hope is holding others professionally engaged. And um, we do this by opening ourselves to meet the needs of every student that comes to us, by including them in the mission of Catholic education, by supporting our teachers in a more intentional way, and um, through professional development and through faith formation. And in the area of uh, Catholic identity and faith formation, we hope by helping others pray every day. Uh, Bishop Van has um, proclaimed a year of prayer in our diocese, and um, it's something that has united us throughout, uh, throughout everything that we do, not only in Catholic schools, but within our parish, uh, parish ministries as well. And so every Sunday I sit in the pew at church, and uh, after, the, uh, after our prayers of the faithful, we all recite 
the uh, uh, prayer that Bishop uh, has, uh, has given to us to, uh, to pray together for our diocese. Um, it's a shared mission with other ministries, and it's establishing respect for the work of the church in all aspects. Um, this shared mission, we've uh, engaged other faith partners, um, definitely here with the McGrath Institute. Uh, we also have a great partnership with ACE uh, Notre Dame, uh, the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education, our uh, um, neighboring, um, uh, uh, neighboring um, Catholic University uh, Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles, the CSJ Educational Network, and the Sophia Institute, just to name a few of our partners and uh, uh, to help us in this, uh, in this journey. Through this work, we have recognized that within the Department of Catholic Schools, um, we have a very high functioning team of people who are not only professionally competent, but who have been well formed in the faith and who are committed to mission. This is not the case in other departments. And so as we kind of work our way through this strategic plan and our strategic goals, we have kind of look around and we see that some of our other ministries are floundering. And so the other realization that has come to us is that although we work on the mission of Catholic education, the mission is not just our own. This is a greater mission of the church. And we need to open ourselves to learn from and support one another within our diocese and in other departments. And that was probably the most recent revelation because we're so busy with the work that we have to do. Who has time, right, to share with others? And yet, the Spirit is speaking and is showing us that this is what we are called to do, to share those gifts, those talents, that understanding of what a strategic plan is with other people maybe who, who don't understand it. And so that's the next step in this uh, co-responsibility and this shift in mindset is that uh, this shift in mindset, it leads us to unexpected places. I never imagined that saying yes to the superintendency would not only have me focusing on my schools, but focusing on other needs of the diocese at large. And yet, my heart is stirring, and I look at my brothers and sisters who are struggling somewhat, and I can tell that God is calling me to support them. And so this shift in mindset is leading me to unexpected places. And so really all of this to me is summarized as the work of the Holy Spirit. I have come to the Diocese of Orange to, to be an instrument of God as guided by the Holy Spirit. This is not my work. It is God's work, I am merely his instrument. I say that publicly, I say it privately because I believe it allowing the spirit to work in you and through you. Um, as Christians, we cannot carry out this mission in isolation, but only in communion with the entire people of God. Our work is not our own. It's all God's work and we are his instruments. And so uh, in summary, these three ideas that have come to me in this journey, this shift in mindset, that um, we need to focus on shifting our own mindset first, that this shift in mindset is messy and that this shift in mindset leads us to unexpected places. Pope Francis states, the Holy Spirit also grants the courage to proclaim the newness of the gospel with boldness in, ver in very every time and place, even when it meets with opposition. Jesus wants evangelizers who proclaim the good news not only with words, but above all by a life transfigured by God's presence. And so I leave you with this which is our mission statement for the Diocese of Orange, the Great Commission, to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and that of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is what guides our work. This is why we are called to co-responsibility. And when we can truly accept that, our work is transformed, and therefore, we can transform others. Thank you. Um, so just... I I want to play off Dr. Barisano's message of hope and share with you, um, take a different angle and tell
tell you about a grassroots movement in the church that has really grown tremendously in, in recent years, such that it has now started at the grassroots level and has now intersected at the diocesan level. Our institute is now working um, closely with Dr. Barisano's diocese to transform some schools there. So I want to spend a lot of time telling you not so much about uh, who we're working with as, as much as why this is working. So I really want to go a little bit more deeply into why this renewal is happening. A little bit about the Institute. Uh, it was founded as a tiny apostolate 20 years ago um, to basically to support and refresh Catholic educators. So it started with a Catholic school textbook project, if you've seen that, in 1999. And then in 2006, we began, or I wasn't there yet, uh, Dr. Andrew Seeley began running programs for Catholic teachers. I found the institute across the street at Holy Cross College when Dr. Seeley was running a program for teachers. And we actually met Bishop Rose at that time. So um, I was called to this work because of my vocation as a mother. My husband and I saw what this form of education did for our youngest son, and we were so profound, it was such a profound difference in terms of his, his uh, love of learning and his love of the faith that I knew at that point that God was calling me to do whatever I could do to get this to every child that I could reach. And so here I am at Notre Dame telling you about it. So I just want to tell you this story. Um, I, I became a teacher at the school was he was at that my son was at, at in second grade at that time, and I saw the same change in my students. And so um, at that point, I, I joined the institute in 2010 to help promote this on a wider basis. So the institute's mission is to promote the renewal of this uh, the church's history and the. Uh, the church's intellectual tradition, which is the classical in the cl classical liberal arts and sciences, and also to train teachers, as, as we said, in its practice. So I just want to begin with this quote. Whoops. Sorry. Um, is that going to work? OK. So. Loyalty to the aims of the Catholic school demands constant self-criticism and return to basic principles, to the motives which inspire the church's involvement in education. The church sees education as full human formation, not, ju not just for the mind, right? So what is Catholic liberal education? You might think of it as Catholic with a large C and a small C. It's Catholic. Um, because it is a universal, freeing formation of the whole person. Liberal in the classical sense, not in the modern sense that means license, but free from ignorance, free to be who we're meant to be, saints. Um, the times that we're living in really demand a constant reflection as to how um, we can really renew the church. We've all seen the Pew study, the Kara study, of how quickly students are losing their faith, even those in Catholic school, that the age of disassociation is lower and lower. And so it's really a crisis at this point. And it, is, it has caused a lot of soul searching and a lot of people to say, how can we go deeper? How can we weave the faith more um, in a more integrated way through our, our children. The church teaches us in Gravissium Educationis that parents are the primary educators of their children. Um, the family is the school of love, and the church, the Catholic schools basically exist to help parents fulfill their baptismal promises to lead their children to the faith. But um, this is the responsibility of the entire church, because our schools are really engines of evangelization when they are proper. And what we are seeing in these schools in this renewal is that they are becoming these vibrant communities of faith and learning, and they are engines of evangelization in the church. So um, I just want to describe a little bit what is happening. 
although I would love to do that. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so the spreading renewal, um, basically schools all over the country are being saved from closure and renewed by recovering the church's tradition in the classical liberal arts and sciences. You can see that case studies report here. You can download it, load it on our website. It just profiles six schools, uh, including Our Lady of Lourdes in Denver that was down to 90 students when it adopted this about seven years ago. Now Our Lady of Lourdes is bursting at the seams with uh, about 300 students. It's had to open a second campus this year. The first school to do this was St. Jerome Academy in Hyattsville, Maryland, which was also slated for closure. Uh, it was down to somewhere in the low 200s, and it was saddled with debt, nearly a million dollars in debt. That school, 10 years later, is now in the black, operating in the black, and it has returned to a true two-track model with about 400 students. So you can see, um, you'll see from this that this approach is flourishing in a whole variety of settings, urban and rural, affluent and low income, in ethnically diverse populations, and importantly, among all kinds of learners. It's very distinctive. You won't see this anywhere else at any price. It's very engaging. And the results are not just increasing enrollment, that's not the most important thing. The increasing enrollment is basically a testament to how children, teachers, and parents are responding to this renewal. Uh, it's drawing back Catholics and even non-Catholics to, uh, to our schools. And um, most importantly, we are seeing just unparalleled faith formation as what children know is really integrated with what they believe. So one distinctive feature is um, just a love of learning. There's really, most of our schools have a real joy in the community because a Catholic school is like a, um, a family, but do we really have joy in learning? This is the kind of education that nurtures the heart, the mind, and the soul. And as we know, uh, modern education seems to have really squeezed a lot of the joy out of learning. So I'd like to show you this disturbing image, right? One seventh grader, 904 grades for one academic year. It took 28 pages to print that out on RenWeb. So it seems that um, we, have, we have lost a vision of what education really is and what an education really is for. Um, this is a burden to teachers, obviously, and it's really oppressive to students. There's this obsessive ob obsession with measurement and quantitative um, and quantification, but not everything that can be measured should be measured, and not everything of value can be measured, right, especially by a standardized test. So sadly, I want to report that this is happening in a Catholic school, a well very well-regarded Catholic school. Why? Because it has very high test scores. But this is not a place, this, this is a place that is ordered toward producing good test scores. And so sadly, we have not escaped this industrial model of education in some cases, and we really need to be aware of this and careful about it. Okay. So sometimes we see things best by comparison. So I'd like to just give you a brief summary. So think about secular education, right? It is ordered toward material temporal ends. So everything downstream from that is, is, is focused in that way. There's nothing wrong with college and career readiness, but if that's your ultimate goal, you're really missing quite a bit. You're missing, you're missing what is necessary for the human person. So it becomes fragmented and industrialized because we have a wide variety of state standards and a wide variety of, of uh, standardized testing. So there's this emphasis on measuring practical skills, uh, pushing across a lot of information. So it becomes one mile wide and one inch deep because teachers are under great pressure just to convey this information. They have to lecture, they can't show, they have to tell because they don't have time, they have to move on. They can't rest in the moment and enjoy the leisure of learning and to, and to cultivate a love of learning in children and they become, because they can't see the big picture, they become susceptible to indoctrination. By contrast, 
The church's tradition in, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, by contrast, the church's tradition in liberal learning is ordered toward eternal happiness. So all of our schools are ordered in this way. Of course, we know this. We're not ordered just toward college and career readiness. But we need to make sure that everything we do is really focused on this end. So the ancients would call that the telos. What, what is the end or the purpose or the goal? And Dr. Barrasano spoke beautifully about really staying focused on the mission. I think we've heard that from a lot of speakers today. So when we're focused on the mission, what does that mean? It means that we're going to have an integration of subjects, knowledge, and faith. Because we understand as Christians that nothing in this world exists in meaningless isolation, that everything is integrated in the logos in whom all things cohere. So this approach to education restores the two things that have been stripped from modern education, the meaning of things and the purpose of things. And in that way, it's awakening wonder in children. St. Thomas Aquinas said that wonder is the first step on the ladder that leads to the beatific vision. So it's incumbent upon us as Catholic educators uh, to, to spark that wonder because a, a form of education that leads to apathy is really not just affecting the intellect, but it's affecting the soul. So we want to form the whole person, that yearning, that yearning for, um, for God, ultimately. This form of education cultivates deep thinking that is, is very broad. The constant discussion, the, the mastery of language, language is the medium of thought, so we want to use language a lot in speech and in writing because it cultivates our ability to think, um, and it develops intellectual freedom. Now, there's another big difference in these two approaches to education, and that's their track record. So just briefly, the historians here will, will give me some license, okay? So just briefly, I want you to compare that, that top white line across the, uh, ed the education for freedom for 2,500 years was seen as the cultivation of wisdom, to know the truth, lowercase t and capital T, and virtue, essentially to imitate the truth, lowercase t, capital T. As Christians, we know that ultimately that, that tradition led to what we know is our mission, the imitation of Christ. That small red box up there represents secular progressive education and its failed experiments in the last 100 years, which are completely contrary to all that preceded it. What happened was the church took up from the ancients um, this, this search for truth, goodness, and beauty, these habits of learning, and ordered them toward Christ. So classical education speaks to the origins of the tradition, but Catholic liberal education speaks to its end, which is freedom in Christ. The church took this and developed it, um, amplified by St. Augustine and especially by St. Thomas Aquinas, who, um, who basically took up the thought of Aristotle and baptized it with Christian eyes. It was further developed by the Jesuits and their famous Ratio Studiorum, or their plan of study. But all this began to change from Enlightenment thinking and modernity. And John Dewey, as you probably know, is the architect of our modern educational system. What many people don't know about John Dewey is that he was an atheist. He engineered a radical shift in educational philosophy because he no longer thought we should ask those big questions that had been asked for 2,500 years. Who is man? What is his purpose? And how ought we to live? Because he thought we can't know the answers to those things, so instead we're going to lower the goal of education. I suppose in his mind it wasn't lowering it, but we're just going to make good citizens for the state. And we see what's happening now if we view the state as the ultimate authority in human endeavors. Now, um, we have been cut off from this tradition that the church perfected and was the gold standard for hundreds of years. And we haven't realized the corrosive effects on both faith and learning. This is not the fault of the men and women who are laboring in Catholic schools. It is not their fault at all. Um, they're doing heroic work, but essentially in a broken system. So as this 
The church's authentic form of education is recovered. It is so gratifying to see all these great people who are working in the field renewed in their vocation to really see faith and learning come together and to see the response of children. The way it's, it's spreading is because the children are so engaged, they're coming home to their families, and the parents are amazed by what they're talking about at the dinner table. And this is spreading so quickly that we really can't keep up. So, um, and here I should say that it has a very curious origin. Really began in sort of the, maybe the 80s, late 80s, with Protestant parents who felt that the secular model of education was just not godly and they took to homeschooling. And where did they turn? They turned to the Catholic intellectual tradition. And they ultimately formed Protestant classical schools, and then Catholic homeschooling parents did the same, homeschooling independent schools. So this has really bubbled up as a grassroots effort that sprang from the hearts of parents, and it seems that God is rewarding this effort because now it has, it has spread very widely in diocesan schools and now full dioceses. We're working in a great number of dioceses now, and it's an exciting time to see these schools flip. Okay, so, so just to review, the Catholic intellectual tradition takes up two things from the ancient world. This spirit of inquiry, the search for truth, goodness, beauty, and as they called it, the logos, which as we know is the incarnate word, and the seven liberal arts. Now, the seven liberal arts, as I like to say, are not those dreaded college majors by which your children will emerge from college without job prospects, our two Notre Dame graduates are, were history majors, and they are gainfully employed, thank you, serving their country. <laughs> um, so the seven liberal arts are the tools of thinking and learning that free us to see the truth of things, right? And art is something that creates something else, that produces something else. St. Thomas Aquinas said that the seven liberal arts produce the works of reason. And we have centuries of data-driven research. And I will just show you the tip of the iceberg that shows that this is true. So please note that before the state controlled education, the Catholic Church developed education. And as I said, it was the gold standard for centuries. And it formed some of the keenest minds and the holiest saints in the history of the world in all fields. Now note that not all of them are Catholic, but their ed the educational system formed them in such a way with the tools of the liberal arts in a coherent view that, that, that sought truth in all these different fields. Um, and it was bound, it was coherent because it was based in the nature of reality and the nature of the human person. So every, um, every educational system is based on a philosophy. There is no such thing as a neutral educational approach. Um, so this philosophy of Christian classical education says that God is at the center of reality, that truth is defined by God, and that knowledge of subjects or things, including man himself, is unified, rational, and consistent. In other words, God has a plan. We can trust in it. This is an education for hope. This is a worldview for hope. By contrast, the philosophy of public education says that man is at the center of reality, that truth is relative to man, and that knowledge of, subject, knowledge of subjects or things including man himself is random, detached, and changing. I think that we can all see what has happened after 100 years of an educational system that has abandoned the search for wisdom and virtue and has abandoned the notion that truth exists at the center of reality. So obviously, the problem with this is that it's a lie. And how ironic. A system of education that purports to put man at its center winds up enslaving man. Think about those 904 grades. We have, I believe, all seen this beautiful quote that really pinpoints that where a beloved modern saint pinpoints all of us on the urgent need for Catholic education, the task of Catholic education. 
The greatest challenge to Catholic education in the United States today and the greatest contribution that authentically Catholic education can make to American culture is to restore to that culture the conviction that human beings can grasp the truth of things and in grasping that truth can know their duties to God, to themselves, and to their neighbors. So why, why is this so important? We are at a particular point in the history of the Christian West. We, we have heard Pope Benedict's warnings about the dictatorship of relativism. We're in a profound cultural and spiritual crisis because if there is no truth, only power prevails. So the mission of a Catholic educator, Catholic educators in the field are on the very front lines of this battle to reclaim the notion that truth exists. And I'll go deeply, more deeply into that uh, next. So we want to return. We want to take our cues not from the secular educational model, but we want to return to the history of the church, history and practice of Catholic philosophy and education, and also current day documents on, um, you know, on what the church has said about education. And if you haven't seen it, this little book, The Holy See's Teachings on Catholic Schools, is a wonderful little compilation of I think all of the documents on education that have come out since Vatican II. Archbishop Miller distills it to these five benchmarks. And as you will see, these are not achievable with a secular curriculum and religion added on. Because a cat, the world is a different place through the eyes of faith, right? We believe in a supernatural order. We believe in the power of prayer, the communion of saints, the possibility of a virgin birth, virgin birth, and the possibility of miracle, right? Founded on a Christian anthropology, we believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God and destined to be with him forever. We're not destined to be cogs in an economic wheel with a good job to buy things. We all need to do those things, but that's not the end goal. We are animated by communion and community. We're not competing with each other for the last seat in Harvard or somewhere else where you don't want to go. Sorry. <laughs> um, and this Catholic worldview throughout the curriculum, in a Catholic school, the books, the programs, the, um, the materials are not the curriculum. Curriculum means way or course. In a Catholic school, Christ is the curriculum. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we are studying reality, we are studying aspects of the divine creation of the Logos in an increasingly complex way, ordered to the development of the child. And of course, sustained by gospel witness. A witness is one who sees. So we need to form ourselves and our teachers to see this divine reality in all things. Um, the document also calls for both content and pedagogy that is truly Catholic, but it never explains what that is. So the Institute spends all of its time trying to figure out what is content and pedagogy that is truly Catholic. And I don't have time to tell you here, I'll keep you all in suspense, but basically the content is going to be mostly the same, right? We're going to still be teaching times tables and we're still gonna be teaching about the Battle of Yorktown, but we're gonna be looking at everything in different eyes, with different eyes, because heaven and earth are full of his glory, and so this is a discovery of the world God made. Pedagogy that is truly Catholic must engage the, chi engage the child's sense of wonder, and it must attend to the child. It must cultivate all that is human in that child. The power to attend, to contemplate, to behold, to speculate, to calculate, to persuade, but also to love that which is worthy of loving, because this is really about St. Augustine's Ordo Amoris, the order of love, that we want to train up children in love. So Catholic education begins in love, the love of parents, the love of the church, and, and is ordered toward love. Let's just talk here about Catholic identity for a moment, right? Catholic identity is, is, is not just something we can tack on. It is a way of looking at the world. So it's, we want to talk about Catholic immersion, Catholic culture. And I'm just going to use three categories here just briefly. They are my labels to sort of sort it out in my mind. We can talk about the ethos of a Catholic school. 
We, I think all Catholic schools are really doing this well, certainly much better than when I came through. Teaching the faith, I think catechesis is, is much stronger. We're doing a lot of this. Um, virtue, formation, all of this. I think this is strong in Catholic schools. But there are two key elements that I believe are missing and that are being recovered in these, in these schools that are recovering the, the church's tradition. And we'll call them mythos, um, by which I simply mean enculturation. Education is also passing on a culture, passing on a heritage. Any anthropologist will tell you that no people survive without knowing their story. And we are not really passing on our story. We aren't passing on um, the history of the, the body of Christ through salvation history, interwoven with history, so that our children can see themselves in this story, being called at a certain place in time, as many saints were in, in throughout history, to respond to a given crisis, uh, as we are facing now, right? Um, Logos is the... Um, the ordering principle of the universe, right? For the ancients, it was the ordering principle of the universe. We know it as the incarnate word, the divine wisdom manifest in creation. This is that sacramental imagination that allows a child to really see the mystery, the beauty, the complexity of the world around them. And this will never be achieved in a utilitarian and pragmatic education that, that was designed by an atheist. So we want to work against that. So in, in terms of mythos, our story, the impact of Christianity and the history of the church, right? The role of the church in science, in architecture, in music, in mathematics, aligned with salvation history. Children respond to story. This change alone is, um, is uh, really profound because they learn by story and they're engaged in it. They're capable of, of much richer content than we expect. And in terms of the Logos, we know that truth is not an abstraction. This beautiful quote from, Saint ben from Pope Benedict, sorry, premature, Pope Benedict XVI, right? Jesus Christ is the personified truth who attracts the world to himself. Every other truth is a fragment of the truth that he is and refers to him. So this is a great mystery, and we will never get to the bottom of it, right? It is under attack in, in schools that will adopt a secular, progressive attitude toward education. And for our Catholic children who are in public schools, this is another reason why we need to preserve Catholic schools and find a way to fund them and find opportunity scholarships and, and everything else we can do because the culture is so hostile and is, is teaching them a different version of reality that is simply not true. We want to invite children to discover this beauty and complexity in the world God made. Um, so the Catholic intellectual tradition then is the unity of faith and reason. This is the gift of the church to the world. This morning, our, um, when B Bishop Rhodes read um, from the Archbishop's speech, he talked about St. Paul going to the Areopagus, right? And he talks about, in that beautiful, in that beautiful exhortation, he, if you read that carefully, he's really saying, you Greeks, uh, I see that you are very religious people. And he goes through and he says, he talks about four different ways that you can know reality, that you can know God, right? The first is in creation. He says, the world God made. He talks about the love of human persons, the experience of love of, the, of human persons. Reason, that we can begin to know God through reason. The Greeks had all of that, but they couldn't have the full picture because they didn't have the fourth one. They didn't have revelation. So authentic Catholic education is recovering this understanding and cultivating eyes to see and ears to hear the connectedness and the unity of all things in Christ. But this begins with the youngest hearts and minds. <clears throat> I'd also just like to point out the relationship here of the transcendentals, right? What is it to study truth, goodness, beauty in the one? Think of how these relate, right? In creation, we can see his beauty, his goodness, and the love of others. 
Through reason, we can come to the knowledge of truth. But only in the one can we see the full picture. I just want to dispel a few myths. So some people hear this and they say, oh, this is so elitist. This is so backward looking. So I just want to address a few of these things very quickly. Elitist, well, you can ask these students, these children at Holy Innocence School in Long Beach, California, 75% um, of whom are on free and reduced lunch, and many of their parents don't speak English. They, this school flipped about a year ago, and that community is on fire for this, and their children, and the children love it. The very question is elitist. Why would we not give the best education and immersion in truth, goodness, and beauty to every child? Every child deserves this. Um, too rigorous for many students? No, it's a highly ordered ladder of learning, and it's very engaging. Backward looking or closed minded? No, we would say that you, we can't understand in the, our stand, ourselves in the modern world until we can understand what came before. Outdated? No, we would say timeless and enduring because most of the modern fads fade. The whole language, it's just, they're, they're quick and they usually fail. Will not prepare students for college and career? No, these are forming minds to think broadly across all disciplines. They will be the moral leaders of the future. Too focused on the humanities and will not prepare students for STEM? No, the quadrivium, the, the seven liberal arts about the mastery of language, mastery of number. So what are, what are STEM but the mastery of number and pattern and, and number? Uh, I, I just, just to finish up, I wanna summarize with two famous images. I wanna summarize everything I just said with two famous Im images. Um, you've probably seen this, the School of Athens, right? It is a huge fresco, 25 feet wide by 16 feet high in the divine proportion. And it represents the school, um, not an actual school of Athens, but the, the Greek love of philosophy, the Greek love of wisdom. And um, we see the quote there, all men by nature desire to know, going back to Aristotle, which we later hear from St. Augustine is, um, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee, right? This is all of a piece. The yearning to know is ultimately a yearning for God. Um, you see there, I won't go through the whole picture. There's all kinds of images in there, but we have Plato and Aristotle at the center. Uh, Plato pointing to the heavens, the ideals, and the forms, and his student Aristotle pointing to the earth and, and saying, we begin to know through our senses. Um, this image represents the search for truth, this Greek love of philosophy. Uh, and the interesting thing is we have more in common with the, these ancient pagans than we do with modern educators. Why? Because they believed that truth exists, that it can be known, and that it can be communicated. Some of you have probably seen this. Can anybody tell me where it is? Yes, it's at the Apostolic Palaces at the Vatican, right, in Raphael's room. So this is one long wall. The two short walls um, represent beauty and truth. But it is the opposite wall that informs everything else. Because if you follow the path of Plato and Aristotle across that room, they are walking directly at this. Our Lord in the monstrance. So what were Pope Julius II and Raphael um, saying by the frescoes in this room? I think they were saying that every question in the human mind and every longing in the human heart can only be answered in our Eucharistic Lord. This is the source and summit of our faith. And only a Catholic school can take the classical liberal arts tradition to its natural end in Christ. So the most important thing we can do for our children is to teach them to attend and to contemplate and to behold, because all of this is preparation for them to behold the Lamb of God and to love the Lamb of God. This is the education for discipleship. These children will be filled with hope and not the skepticism and cynicism of the modern world, and they will not doubt the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. Thank you. Thank you.